Well, isn't that everyone's favorite question? Among Eastern Roman history enthusiasts, Byzantium has become a kind of a dirty word. People who use it are accused of denying the Eastern Romans their fundamental identity, and there is something of a movement to stop or at least limit its usage in literature and media. However, the academics, who have the word Byzantium in their job titles, are not as keen on renaming and revolutionizing their whole field of studies. In the meantime, the people who try to navigate this field are given oversimplified outdated notions from 19th century historiography that fundamentally distort their understanding of the topic going forward. I think this situation needs to be changed, and the usage of the word Byzantium lies at the forefront of this issue. But to answer the question of if and when this word should be used, we first need to determine what is Byzantium, who are the Byzantines, what is their claim to the Roman identity, and how did they get robbed of it by historians. And if you don't want your identity to get stolen like the Byzantines had, you should seriously consider getting Surfshark VPN. Surfshark VPN encrypts your internet traffic and prevents your IP and other sensitive information from being accessed by thieves and scammers. It also allows you to pick the location from which you connect to the internet and to receive all the benefits of actually being there. Surfshark VPN would have been a dream come true for any Byzantine emperor, tired of catching flag for calling yourself a Roman emperor but never having been in Rome. With one click, you can change your virtual location to the Eternal City, and the rest of the internet will think that you're actually there. With my promo code, you'd also receive three months of subscription for free, so your imperial treasury would remain intact. I'm not any kind of emperor, but I still have many uses for Surfshark VPN. For instance, I use Discord a lot, and with Surfshark VPN, I can take advantage of local pricing and spend less on Discord's paid features. And whenever I have to travel and use a public Wi-Fi that I cannot fully trust, I can set up Surfshark VPN to secure my data, and even to drop the internet connection if the VPN protection becomes temporarily unavailable. Follow the link in the description to get Surfshark VPN right now, and don't forget to use my promo code ROMABU to receive 3 months for free. I am always glad when I get a comment saying something like, I'm actually, you're talking about Byzantium. There was no Roman Empire after 476 CE, because this means my videos are reaching a wider audience. My usual viewers are more in the loop on the whole Byzantine versus Roman question, but for those of you who are new to it, I will give a brief summary of the history of this term. Byzantium is the name of the ancient city on the Bosphorus, founded in the 7th century BC by Byzas, a son of King Nysos of Megara. In 330 AD, it was refounded by Emperor Constantine as Nova Roma, the New Rome. Constantine made it a capital of his empire, and after his death, it became known as Constantinople. It remained the capital of the eastern half of the empire after the administrative split and after the western half ceased to exist as a political entity. Contrary to popular imagination, there was never a renaming of the empire from Roman to Byzantine. The word Byzantine was used sometimes, but only to refer specifically to the inhabitants of the capital, never to the whole of the Roman world. See for example this passage from Ataliatis, where he comments that the sight of a paraded elephant delighted the Byzantines and other Romans who happened to see it. The word Byzantium became the name of the medieval Roman Empire only more than a century after its downfall. This happened through the works of a German historian Hieronymus Wolf, and his later disciples in Italy and France. The publication of a massive collection of Eastern Roman writings under the title Corpus Historia Byzantina popularized the term in European intellectual circles, and it gradually became accepted as the academic name for the Eastern Romans. The research discipline that deals with their history and culture is generally called Byzantine studies. So as you can see, the word Byzantium comes not from self-identification, but from historiography. And it begs the question, should historians go around giving names to the states and the peoples who already had names for themselves? In this particular example, the question is made more controversial by the fact that this self-identification is Roman, the name with as much historical prestige and authority as one can imagine. The opponents of Byzantium's Romanness often base their arguments on allegedly irreconcilable differences between the Empire of Antiquity and of the Middle Ages, and paint this self-identification as an empty label, meant to signify something other than what it sounds like. 
So let's determine whether these arguments hold any merit. The question of Byzantium's Romanness can be divided into two different levels – the state and the nation. The first is whether or not Byzantium was the Roman Empire, and the second is whether or not its inhabitants were the Romans. These two questions are often bundled together into one, but they don't have to have the same answer. Consider, for example, the Holy Roman Empire. A lot of people would be fine calling Frederick Barbarossa a Holy Roman Emperor, but I don't know anyone who's going to claim that his subjects were the Holy Romans, or any kind of Romans for that matter. I myself made a video on April 1st defending the legitimacy of that title, but claiming the existence of the Holy Roman nationhood would have been a bit too silly even on such a date. The same principle works for the Eastern Empire. There are people who would staunchly deny the Roman identity of the Byzantines, but would still begrudgingly agree that the emperor in Constantinople was a Roman one. So let's first tackle the question on the state level. The simplest and the most straightforward argument in favor of Byzantium's Romanness is continuity. The Roman state never explicitly changed its identity from the original Respublica. Almost all of its aspects, including the geography, the political structure, the dominant language and religion have changed between the mythical days of Roman kings and the final hours of the Ottoman siege, but the ethos of the state as the polity of the Romans have remained the same. This makes the whole question of the Romanness of the Byzantine Empire very similar to the ship of Theseus. If you know what it is, you can skip about a minute forward, and if you don't, you can listen to my explanation. The ship of Theseus is an ancient thought experiment described by Plutarch and his parallel lives. According to Plutarch, the Athenians preserved the original ship on which Theseus returned from his journey to Crete, but as the ship's parts decayed, they were replaced by new ones. Over time, not a single plank from the original ship remained, so the Athenian philosophers posed the question, is this still the ship of Theseus, or is it no longer the same ship? This is a question of the nature of identity and change. If an object has changed every single one of its parts, is it still the same object? Then, in the 17th century, Thomas Hobbes proposed a parallel thought experiment. What if there was a man who would keep all the original ship's details that were discarded and then reassemble them together? Would the ship that he built be the same as the original one? Does it have a better claim to that identity? than the one that had shared all of its original planks. Basically, if you think that the Athenian ship of Theseus is still the same ship, then you would agree that Byzantium is the Roman Empire. And if you think that the ship assembled from the discarded planks has a better claim, then you'd feel very welcome at the court of the Holy Roman Emperor. Those who disagree with the notion that Byzantium is the Roman Empire always have in mind some sort of special property that defines the Roman character something that you can't change without losing the original Romanness. This special plank can be the state religion, the dominant language, geographical extent, or some attribute of the government. Sometimes it isn't a single characteristic, but a set of them. Each of these is associated with some special date, when the empire stopped being Roman and started being Byzantine. I personally do not subscribe to this point of view. As Heraclitus has said, Change is the only permanent thing in the world. Every state in history has experienced changes to its structure and society, and the evolution of the Roman polity has actually been surprisingly gradual in comparison. The Augustan reforms were probably the most drastic in Roman history and are acknowledged as such in historiography. They ended the Republican era and started the Imperial one, but even they do not constitute a revolution or a refounding of the country and neither does any other reform throughout the empire's later history. One can argue that Diocletian's or Constantine's reforms were so fundamental that they may be called a revolution figuratively, but these emperors were working within the same political framework as their predecessors. The imperial acclamation affirmed every new emperor as the successor to the previous one. Even during the Latin occupation in the 13th century, all of the splinters of the empire maintained their claim to be the polity of the Romans. Going from the Roman Republic to the Roman Empire is a less controversial historiographical transition, because the names of the periods are self-explanatory. At some point during the reign of Augustus, the mode of governance changed to a more autocratic one, and this is why we separate Roman history into these two eras. 
It's clear that a political change has happened, but there is no confusion as to whether both the Republic and the Empire were Roman. Same as when talking about the French Republic and the French Empire, everybody understands that both of them are France. Using the word Byzantium is a different matter. Not calling it Roman gives an impression that this is some separate thing. It would have been fine if the Byzantine era was some short transient period in Roman history, like the Weimar Republic was for Germany. But instead, it spans about the same length as the rest of Roman history. And consciously or not, it makes people perceive Byzantium as different, even though it's the same empire that was ruled by Theodosius, Constantine and their predecessors. Some people tiptoe around this issue by using phrases like technically the Roman Empire, the heir to the Roman Empire, or the successor of the Roman Empire. I don't particularly like any of those. These phrases put Byzantium into the same category as something like the HRE or Russia, the states which claim to uphold the legacy of the Roman Empire or continue its mission, but which clearly were different political entities. Byzantium didn't have a political identity other than the Roman one, and its emperors didn't moonlight as the rulers of some German statelet. The Byzantine Empire was the Roman Empire, with the line of emperors going back to Augustus and the government institutions that evolved from the days of the Republic. But doesn't it legitimize the claim of the Ottoman Sultan? He also took over the Eastern Roman government and styled himself the Caesar of the Romans. Doesn't this argument mean that it is all the same empire going forward? It is true that the Ottoman governance had been profoundly influenced by the Byzantine tradition after the conquest. There were elements of the administration which the Ottoman Sultans inherited from the Byzantines, albeit under new names. But the Ottoman conquest was obviously a takeover from outside. The Ottomans had their own state and their own political identity prior to taking Constantinople. And they continued on absorbing some elements of the Roman state, but not redefining themselves in the process. In an alternate reality where Mehmed and his successors would have done more to integrate the Roman administrative apparatus, political institutions and customs into their own government, the notion of the Ottoman succession to the Roman Empire could have actually been entertained in the same sense as we speak about the Holy Roman Emperor's legitimacy. But as history played out, the Kaiseri Rum title turned out to be just one among many others which the Sultans used to boost their prestige. Out of all philosophers of our time, Mike from Breaking Bad has the best response to the Ottoman pretensions to Roman heritage. Listen, Walter, just because you shot Jesse James, don't make you Jesse James. So, okay, it's the same empire, but what about the elephant in the room? It is called Roman, but didn't even control the city of Rome for most of its history. It's a fair point to make, and is probably the main source of confusion for the newcomers to the history of Byzantium. Those familiar with Roman history in late antiquity know that the city of Rome lost a lot of its importance by the 4th century. Throughout the 3rd century crisis, many of the emperors haven't even got to visit Rome during their reign. The Roman senatorial elite tried several times to regain the old status. But with the establishment of the new Rome on the Bosphorus, it became clear that the political pool of the Eternal City had weakened. Constantinople, therefore, became the new imperial center, and in time proved to be much more resilient in that role than the old capital. However, it never occurred to any of Constantine's successors to stop calling themselves the Emperor of the Romans and become the Emperor of Constantinopolitans. This is because their authority, or imperium, was not over a city, but over a nation. And this is where we get into the more controversial part of the question. The Byzantine self-identification as the people, and the notion of Roman nationhood and ethnicity. The controversy stems from the fact that Byzantine history is a part of the national history of Greece, and affirming the Romanness of the Byzantines is sometimes seen as an affront to that. I myself do not see the Roman identity of Byzantium as a reason to exclude it from Greek history, but I'm not from the Balkans, so what do I know about Dutch historical subjects? Nevertheless, I'm going to try and explain my position, which is largely based on the works of a certain historian. So there is this guy called Anthony Caldellis. He is a professor of Byzantine studies at the University of Chicago, and he has a lot of very controversial opinions on Byzantine history. 
Most of his takes are a bit too hot for my taste. And also his top 10 emperor's list sucks. But on the topic of Roman identity, his arguments are very persuasive. In his book called Roman Land, Ethnicity and Empire in Byzantium, Caldellus presents a conception of medieval Roman identity that is much more coherent than the more popular understandings and is backed up by strong evidence. The following section of this video is pretty much going to be a quick summary of the arguments from this book, which I strongly advise you to read. We start by analyzing the legal aspect of Roman identity. During a better part of antiquity, the meaning of being a Roman was closely tied to possessing a Roman citizenship. Gradually, this privilege was extended from just the natives of the city to more distant communities. This culminated in the Edict of Caracalla, which gave Roman citizenship to every free man in the empire, regardless of origins. There was no citizenship test. Your religion or ability to speak Latin didn't matter. If you lived in the empire and weren't a woman, a slave, or a defeated barbarian settled in a reservation, you were now a Roman citizen. This decree had been reaffirmed in the 6th century by Justinian. Today there is a tendency to trivialize the Roman identity of the Byzantines to a notion of mere citizenship, as in whenever the Byzantines use the word Roman, they simply mean a citizen. However, it is apparent from the literary sources that it wasn't the case. There are a couple of examples which can illustrate this. The first is the acclamation of Anastasius I. In 491, the Emperor Zeno died, and the people of Constantinople assembled in the Hippodrome to meet his widow Ariadne and decide on who should be the new emperor. One of their demands was that the emperors should give them a Roman emperor. May you be blessed with all good things, Roman woman, if no foreign element is added to the race of the Romans. Why did they specifically call for a Roman emperor? Weren't they all automatically Roman? The reason for this was the ethnicity of the previous emperor, Zeno. Zeno was an Isaurian, which is evident from his native name, that I am not even going to try to pronounce. The Isaurians were a people from the Taurus Mountains, combative, fierce and independent. They had a reputation of being stereotypical barbarians, wild and uncivilized. Zeno, like all the Isaurians, held Roman citizenship, but was still seen as a foreigner, despite the fact that the Isaurians lived within Roman lands for many centuries, and Zeno himself was the emperor. Having citizenship was not enough to be automatically accepted as a Roman. In contrast to the Isaurians of the 5th century stood the Galatians. The Galatians were the neighbors of the Isaurians and just like them, lived in their own ethnic community. But unlike the Isaurians, the Galatians were much better accustomed to the Roman way of life, so much so they were accepted as real Romans. Here's their characterization from the court orator Themistios. Look at the Galatians, the ones in the Pontos. These men crossed over into Asia under the law of war, and having depopulated the entire region on this side of the Halis, settled in this territory which they now inhabit. And neither Pompey nor Lucullus destroyed them, although this was perfectly possible. Nor Augustus, nor the emperors after him. Rather they remitted their sins and assimilated them into the empire. And now no one would ever refer to the Galatians as barbarian, but as thoroughly Roman. For while their ancestral name has endured, their way of life is now akin to our own. They pay the same taxes as we do. They enlist in the same ranks as we do. They accept governors on the same terms as the rest and abide by the same laws. So there was some requirement of the degree of assimilation for a member of an ethnic community to be accepted as Roman. I don't like comparisons to the modern world, but there is definitely a parallel with different immigrant diasporas in the United States and their assimilation struggles. This notion of Romanness, which Caldellus calls ethnicity, has a twofold nature. On one hand, it is a regular group identity, defined by the similarities within the group and the differences from other groups. Roman authors used many different words to describe it, but mainly genos, ethnos and philon. Here is an excerpt from the writings of Constantine VII. For each nation has different customs and divergent laws and institutions. It should consolidate the things that are proper to it, and it should form and activate the associations that it needs for the fusion of its life from within its own nation. For just as each animal species mates with its own race, 
So it is right that each nation also should marry and cohabit, not with those of a different tribe and tongue, but of the same race and speech. In today's world, Constantine VII would have certainly got cancelled very fast. The interbreeding comment aside, this shows how the Romans viewed themselves as just another nation among many. Sure, their ethnos might have been superior to that of the Bulgars, Arabs or Franks, but they were all on the same playing field and could change their standing among other nations through collective effort. But there was also another side to the notion of Roman nationhood, a more elitist and exclusive. This was the understanding of the Romans as the chosen people. Here's a passage from the Miracles of St. Demetrius that talks about the provincial Romans, who were taken prisoner, resettled in Pannonia by the Avar Khan, and intermarried with Bulgars, Avars, and other non-Roman people. But each child received from its father the ancestral tradition of the Romans and the impulse of their race. And just as the race of Israel grew in size in Egypt under the Pharaoh, so did it happen with them. The tribe of the Christians increased through the Orthodox faith and holy baptism. Speaking among themselves about their ancestral homeland, they lit in each other's heart the secret hope that they might escape. So here we have a different situation. Some Roman people were forcibly taken outside of the empire and had to form their own ethnic community in captivity. For the devout Byzantine writers, this invited obvious comparisons with the biblical people of Israel. Seeing themselves as the God's chosen people gained popularity among the Romans in the 7th century. As the empire suffered staggering territorial losses, its people looked for familiar narratives to explain this divine punishment. Naturally, they found one in the Old Testament and the tribulations of the people of Israel. This puts the Romans as the Genos and all the people around them as ethnicoi, the ethnic types. It's the same word that is used as a translation of the Hebrew word goim, the Gentiles. The Orthodox faith was seen as the primary conduit of Romanness. However, as different nations around them, like the Bulgars and the Rus, adopted the same religion, the Byzantines shifted their definition of nationhood more towards what is described by Constantine VII. Shared traditions, institutions, language and culture. Caldolas points out that this is very similar to our modern definition of a nation. Okay, so the Byzantines were a nation based on the shared culture, custom and language. But we know that they spoke the Greek language, so that means that they are Greeks, not Romans, right? Well, not so fast. The language is one of the aspects of this identity, but it isn't the only one. People make a really big deal out of the transition from Latin to Greek as the dominant language, and act like speaking a Greek dialect is somehow incompatible with identifying as a Roman. A while ago I made a video about the claim that Heraclius changed the official language to Greek. Heraclius didn't really do any such thing. Greek has been used in the administration of the empire way before Heraclius, and some ceremonial Latin continued to be employed centuries after his reign. Romans speaking Greek was a thing ever since the conquest of Greece. People as undeniably Roman as Julius Caesar and Augustus spoke Greek at home more often than Latin. In the late Republic, one practically had to be fluent in Greek to receive a quality education. Among the lower classes, identification as Roman while speaking Greek was also uncontroversial. Saint Paul addresses his epistle to the Romans, but it is written in Greek. In the later centuries, when Latin was pretty much abandoned for good, the name for the dominant Greek dialect became Romaica, the Roman language. It should be noted that even though I used Greek and Hellene interchangeably, these were two different ethnonyms. Greek or Grecos was used informally, mainly to refer to people who came from the region of Greece. In this context, it can't be juxtaposed with the Roman, because it is a regional identity. One can be both Romeos and Grecos. If a Byzantine wanted to say culturally Greek, he or she would say Elin, a word which invokes ancient Sparta, Athens and Mount Olympus. Those who claim that the inhabitants of the medieval Roman Empire were not Romans generally mean that they were culturally not Roman but Greek. So in this context, Greek and Hellene are synonyms. The popular notion that the Byzantines used Roman merely as another name for being Greek doesn't really stand up to scrutiny. People of the Eastern Empire traced their cultural ancestry back to the Roman Republic, not the Hellenic city-states or Alexander's kingdom. 
Their heroes were all either Christian saints or the ancient Romans. The Christian part of their ethos is well known, but you'd be surprised at how many of the old Republican heroes appear in the Byzantine tales. Nikephoros Phokas invoked Scipio Africanus in his speeches before battle. The Bishop of Antioch called men to discipline by reminding them of Manlius Torquatus, and the Byzantine noble families claimed descent from the old Roman Gentes like Fabi and Corneli. The geographical distance didn't really bother them much. The link to the Roman past was the career of Constantine the Great. According to the Byzantine imagination, Constantine populated his new Rome with nobles whom he brought from old Rome. Byzantine sources sometimes draw a distinction between themselves and the ancient pagan Romans, but they always refer to them as their ancestors. The Hellenic tradition, on the other hand, was way less popular. Apart from the ever once favorite Alexander, heroes of pre-Roman Greece don't really make appearances in Byzantine legendary genealogies. And it makes sense in retrospect. Greece was a part of the Roman state since the 2nd century BC, so its people have long grown accustomed to their Romanness. Imagine teaching national history to a Byzantine child. If the ancient Romans were merely some outside conquerors of our people, why do we keep calling ourselves Roman? An interesting aside are those ethnic nicknames that some Byzantines had. Historians especially liked giving them to emperors called Leo. We have Leo the Thracian, Leo the Syrian, Leo the Khazar, and Leo the Armenian. These were references to either some ethnic heritage or to the region where the said emperor served in the military. But they are not indicators of the emperor's personal identification with those ethnicities or regions. Leo the Armenian was not suspected of dual loyalty or favoritism towards Armenia, and Leo the Khazar wasn't riding around Constantinople like a steppe nomad. A modern comparison serves best to illustrate the situation. You can start calling US presidents Joe the Irishman and Barack the Kenyan, but you have to still admit that they are American. The same way, all the Eastern Roman emperors were accepted by their subjects as Roman. Except for Zeno, apparently. That guy was an Isaurian. Another fact which contradicts the notion that for the Byzantines, Roman was just another name for Greek, is that there was actually a debate about the Hellenic identity in the Byzantine intellectual circles. Several scholars like Michael Sellos worked to rehabilitate the image of a Hellene and associate it less with paganism and more with the philosophies of Plato and Aristotle. Some, like Gemistos Plethon, even advocated abandoning the Roman identity in favor of the Hellenic one. In a world where people of the empire thought of themselves as Hellenes and just used Roman as a codeword for being Greek, this wouldn't have made any sense. The outsiders, barring certain important exceptions, also acknowledged the Romanness of the Byzantines. Arabic, Persian, Slavic, and even early Frankish historians all called the Byzantines by some exonym derived from Rome. Calling them Greeks began only after the split between Constantinople and the papacy in the 8th century. This was a political trick employed by the Western European powers, who had a specific political agenda in challenging the Eastern Empire's claim to the legacy of ancient Rome. The Byzantines themselves saw it for what it was, and naturally hated it. When papal emissaries came to Nikephoros Phokas addressing him as the Emperor of the Greeks, he threw them in jail. This lingering habit of denying the Eastern Romans their identity was still there when the academic institutions for studying them were being established, and had sadly become ingrained in the popular imagination. The Roman identity in the Eastern Roman Empire was different from just speaking the vernacular Greek or having Hellenic ancestry. It was different from only being an Orthodox Christian, and it was different from simply being a citizen of the Empire. It was related to all of the above, but was more than a combination of these labels. It was an identity based on shared culture, history, tradition, and awareness of common origin. Caldaldus calls it an ethnicity. I think nationality is a better word because ethnicity has a lot of genetic and biological connotations. But I obviously don't have the same level of authority as a professor from a prestigious university. You can call it whatever you like, just be aware of its nature and don't fall for trivializations like just another name for being Greek and others. But there is a whole field called Byzantine studies. How can there be a whole separate discipline if the Byzantines were Romans as you claim? 
There is also an academic field called intersectionality studies, and you can even get a degree in it. We have already discussed how the name Byzantine studies came to be. Using it as a proof of the Byzantines' non-Romanness is circular logic. But now that we've established that the Byzantines were Romans, shouldn't we just stop using that word? I think we can definitely benefit from dialing down its usage. Byzantium is fine in an academic context, as a name of the period of Roman history, but the fact that this name doesn't directly reference Rome is very confusing for a layman. It makes people think that this is some separate and completely unrelated thing. Switching to calling the Romans Byzantines at some arbitrary point contributes to the popular image of Roman history, where the Romans are all late Republican patricians and legionnaires up until 476, and the Byzantines are all bearded monks and priests in fine robes. For this reason, I think it shouldn't be used at all in historical media. In other contexts, however, it serves a purpose as a useful synonym for the medieval Roman Empire. I would generally try to use it sparingly, but still employ it sometimes to avoid repetition. The only time I'd strongly object to it is when it's used as a way to deny the continuity between the ancient and the medieval empire, and to disregard its Roman identity. You don't need a B-word passed from an actual Eastern Roman to say Byzantium. Just use it with an awareness of historical context, and we'd all be fine. I hope this video was useful to you. If you want more examples that demonstrate Byzantine's adherence to their Roman roots, Caldellus provides them in spades in his book Roman Land. You can also look directly into the primary sources and form your own opinion. All this is still an ongoing debate in academic circles, and there's always more to uncover. Also, don't forget to check out Surfshark VPN and use my promo code to get 3 months for free. Thanks a lot for watching, and I will see you in the next one.